Uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to thank Inkpass for inviting me here. Uh, genuinely is a, a pleasure to be here. I was here three weeks ago and uh, love, love Indiana. I'd, I'd never visited. I was, I'd lived in Virginia for 10 years, but had never had the opportunity to come here. And I genuinely enjoy it here. So glad to be here again and glad to be coming back in July. Um, be before we start, if you don't mind, I'd like to make friends. Yeah. So I'm from Wales, um, not from England. Um, for those of you that are familiar with the UK, four countries, Wales is bolted on the side of England, okay? Um, where I come from, um, I would introduce myself, I don't speak a lot of Welsh, but I speak enough to get myself in trouble, especially after a few beers. So um, if you don't mind, I did this with the leadership, uh, the emerging leadership group this morning. Um, first of all, uh, just in, ask in English, uh, are you feeling okay? Good? Good. In Welsh, we would turn around and say, Shurachi Hedu, and you would turn around and say, Dayaun Dioch. Okay? So if you don't mind, we'll rehearse really quick. You have to say, Dayaun Dioch. Fantastic. Here we go. Shurachi Hedu. Fantastic. You've just signed over your first newborn to me. <laughs> <leave. laughs> I was asked, obviously, to come in and speak about knowledge management. And the first thing I would like you to do is forget the term knowledge management. I think that if we were to sit here at the moment, we'd start to come in and go, what are you here to talk about? I don't get it. And it's probably a state of confusion, OK? What I'm more interested in are what are the pain points? Yeah, what are we experiencing out there? First of all, as individuals. Yeah, organizations, and then the organizations that you provide services to, or if you are within an organization, what kind of those internal services, what are they actually responding to? So I want to explore that. To do it, uh, we're going to go on a bit of a journey. We're going to start on what those pain points look like. We're then going to talk about what lies behind that. Are we talking about people? Are we talking about technology? What does all this mean? Okay. We're then going to go into what does the internal environment look like in an organization? What type of things are they experiencing? What, how does knowledge exist? What does it mean? I'm then going to share with you some ideas around, the, uh, around dynamic, agile, and adaptive organizations. I'm going to show you some videos. I figure that's the best way to entertain you. And hopefully, we'll have enough of a discussion and enough of a, an idea that we can then go into the Knowledge Cafe piece having some interesting conversations about what the future might look like and how you might have to adjust your thinking yeah, for the future. OK? So that's kind of going to be the journey today. And I'm hoping that I achieve that somehow. Um, what I'd like to start with is looking at what does the future mean. If we look at the moment on what organizations are experiencing, they are in a very unique environment. Okay? Ever since about 2008, the bravado that organizations had at throw money, take risks, any idea is a good idea, let's see what we can do, is now gone. We are now dealing with a risk-averse senior and executive management that now wants evidence. They want to know what the risks look like. And we are in a situation where, if we're honest, I think for this generation and possibly the next generation, the business environment will not recover from that. That bravado, I don't think we will get it back anytime soon. I don't think we're out of it, whether we're talking northern or southern hemisphere, we're not out of it and we have a long way to go. Okay. Businesses at the moment, if you look at, regardless of sector, if you look at what they're challenged with, what we're actually hearing, uh, companies like Deloitte, since about two, uh, 2006, 2008, 2010, are turning around and saying the biggest challenge for an organization at the moment is innovation. That's the biggest pressure point for an organization, is innovation. And they're saying it's regardless of sector. And the reason being, we live in a very disruptive, we transact in a very disruptive environment at the moment. And one of the, my favorite examples and one of the best ways that I can kind of get this across to you, especially when we're looking at services, is 
When I was younger, in the 1980s, if I wanted to book a holiday, I would go into a travel agent, I'd read a brochure, I would then, based on the recommendation of that travel agent's own brochure, I would pick a holiday. I'd go and stay in a hotel, and if I didn't like the experience, I'd come home, I'd tell all my mates, and they possibly wouldn't go to that hotel, but it would take a long time for that hotel's reputation to be seriously damaged, and probably they wouldn't adjust the level of service for a, long, you know, for a number of years. Now there's this wonderful thing called TripAdvisor. And my wife absolutely detests me because any time we want to go on holiday, I will search through every single opinion on any given hotel or location. And guaranteed, I will find the one that didn't like it. Yeah, and then I begin questioning things. But what's more interesting is the actual response from the hotels themselves now. When they're getting compliments, thank you very much, glad you enjoyed it, look forward to seeing you again, instant response. They recognize the value of the customer. If you didn't enjoy it, we're sorry, we are looking to respond to that, we are doing this, they will then feed back later, we address this, next time you visit with us, you'll see we have, we have changed, please try us again. Globalization and technology. People expect quicker service, better service. Organizations have to develop, deliver it with less resource, but we are looking for an instant response. If you want another, more evidence of how things have changed, think back to the Sony Walkman. When the Sony Walkman was first introduced in the early 1980s, it was still available in the 1990s. The original format, it was a very simple thing. Now, if you look at the life cycle of the iPod, how many variations have we seen over a five or six year period? Demand, it's higher. Now, that means that organizations are being asked to innovate. Did anybody, has anybody seen the Wall Street Journal today? I think it's section B, front page. Yeah, that the word innovation is overused, okay? What we're talking about with innovation is truly a new concept, a new idea, something that is radical, something that changes. Actually, that's not what organizations are, are usually talking about when they speak about innovation. They are talking about new ideas, but not radical change. They're looking at service improvement, the development of a better product, the something that responds to customer needs quicker. But these are the pressures that organizations are under regardless of sector. Now then, you position this against a risk-averse economy and a risk-averse management, and we suddenly need people that are able to risk assess decisions. If we're looking at innovation, then we get a number of good ideas. Loads of ideas. I'm sure that if we sat down here today and asked them how you can develop service for in the accounting auditing field, you would be able to, as a big group like this, I'm sure we could at least get, what, 10, 20, 30, 40 ideas? But what's the difference between a good idea and a viable business decision? And that's where I would argue that you are coming into it, especially in the auditing field. We're seeing at the moment that organizations are asking for more critical thinkers. It's not necessarily about the foundational knowledge anymore. In a recent uh, uh, IIA report that has come out, they have turned around and said that when you look at what organizations require the most at the moment, 69% turned around and said it is about critical thinking, problem solving. We want people that are able to risk assess strategic decisions, operational decisions, that are able to manage intellectual capital. This is the auditing field saying that auditors need to be in a position to manage intellectual capital. Why? If we have this idea, as some of you might have had coming in here today, that knowledge management is about technology, Anybody who goes on the internet and you Google knowledge management, I would say that one of the adverts that will come up will be SharePoint. Yeah, that is a knowledge management solution apparently. But organizations are saying that actually their biggest challenge is innovation. My challenge to you would be this. 
And apologies for those who've heard this before, but we've got loads of laptops out here. Leave it alone for six months. Don't do anything with it and tell me what it innovates. What will it present to us? What will it provide us that is new? People are at the core of what we're talking about here, whether we're talking about decision making, the risk assessment, or whether we're going all the way through to what businesses require, which is innovation. People decide what information is put into a computer. People decide what is presented. When it is presented, you make the decision on what you will do with it. Will you do anything? Because if you don't, it just sits there. When you look at the data that's inside those, uh, in, look at our databases and what's in there, if you never activate it, it just sits there. A computer doesn't sit there and go, I know, I'll analyze all this and I'll come up with a new product for you. The decisions are actually taken by people. That's where we start to look at intellectual capital and the management of knowledge. If you buy into all that, then we've got another problem that starts to surface. At the moment, we are dealing with an aging workforce. And by the way, I apologize, I like to walk back and forth. Yeah? I've got students at the university, by the way, that actually do track how many times I walk back and forth. <laughs> okay? Where was I? I interrupted myself. Thank you very much. So, the aging workforce, and I'm doing it again already, um, the aging workforce, it means that some of the most valuable knowledge and expertise resides in the upper levels of the organization. The question is, what are we actually doing to capture that knowledge and expertise as it separates from the organization? Are we doing anything? Do we need to do anything? If we don't do anything, what's the cost to relearn what we already know? If you think about, net, if you look at yourselves now and think about your network, you have a problem, who do you go to? So you have a critical problem on a project, who do you go to? You don't have to tell me. But who else could solve that problem for you? If that person that you normally go to no, is no longer around, who else exists? If it's only one or two people, we've got a problem. Because once they go, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? If they're headhunted out of the organization, if they retire, what do you do? How will that impact your decision making, cap your decision -making capability, the provision of service, customer confidence, anything? This is a major issue that often gets ignored. Now the question is, can you actually write everything down? Can you capture everything? That's a question that we're going to try and move on to for you. So at the moment, we have a situation where we know that organizations are reliant on knowledge, right the way through from needing to innovate through to decision making and risk assessment. We also know that within organizations, we have a problem because we do have an aging workforce. We've also got a situation where, at the moment, there is high pre Have you seen the briefing paper for this? Apologies. Did you get the briefing paper? If you, just a recap for you. At the moment, because of the risk-averse nature of the, of the management teams, it's actually the best of times, to perhaps, to be in the accounting and auditing field. Because at the moment, there is high demand for quality accounting and auditing services to support the decision-making process. It's also the worst of times, because demand is outstripping supply. They also want quality. One of the biggest complaints coming out is actually the emerging workforce doesn't have these critical competencies, decision-making, uh, communication, teamwork. Actually, this whole idea of collaboration, it's not there for us. We've got a problem. If you can't find it in the existing workforce, where do you go? I'd argue that you start to look offshore. If you look at Deloitte's latest talent management report, they say that the biggest, uh, the biggest challenge currently facing organizations is the fact that they are looking at a talent, offshore talent management. Here's the next problem. If we have to start looking offshore for solutions, then we're actually shipping out our base level knowledge. 
That means that I would argue that offshore solutions will become more powerful because they will have that knowledge base to start looking at how do we develop new solutions, new services, etc. So we're actually starting to ship out future competitive advantage. I'd argue that to be a problem. There was a very interesting, just to give you a bit more context, uh, James Cameron, looking to make Avatar 2, has said that he is going to be taking the production to China. Why? Because it's going to save him money. He will make more money. That's fantastic. Except now you are equipping the Chinese economy with the base level knowledge to be able to be more competitive than North American, UK, and so therefore we will actually give more business to them in the future. Short termism missing perhaps the long term picture. But all, everything we're talking about right now is about knowledge. Now the question becomes, if it is so valuable, should we invest some time and money in managing the resource? My answer to that is absolutely. Now the next question then is, what the heck is knowledge? Because if we can agree that knowledge management, the management of this resource is vital, is interesting, what is it? Because if we can't define it, if we can't give it some context, if it's not something that can be understood from senior executive management right the way through to a receptionist, then we've got a problem. Because it will become pink and fluffy, and it will be something that we look at and go, we don't understand it, so therefore a SharePoint solution sounds like a good idea. I'm doing something about it. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to throw something over to you very quickly. I know that you saw the ink pass uh, definition of knowledge, but I would like you to develop a definition of knowledge that you can present in a 30-second elevator pitch. Are you familiar with the elevator pitch? Yeah? If, if you're not, find somebody on the table that does. Okay? But what I'm going to give you, five minutes. Knowledge is a resource to your organization, so therefore, what are you managing? What is it? Okay, so if you don't mind, your five minutes starts now. <laughs> right. And time. Okay, so in five minutes, did you manage to agree on what knowledge is? Yes. Fantastic. <laughs> Somebody, come on. Uh, do we have a microphone that we can use by any chance? Sorry, this is. Oh, no. Uh, you're going to have to. Uh, this is a bit unfair. And I'll I, tell I you. Give... Okay, go on then. Yeah, right. No, I okay, okay. Did, okay. They did. The definition they came up with is knowledge is an evolving truth from experiences to apply to current situations and future situations. Can I, let's see if I can read this. It is an. It's those three. It's an evolving truth from uh, our experiences to apply to current situations and future situations. Yeah. Wow. What is an evolving truth? What is truth? <laughs> it's evolved. It's dynamic. Yeah. It's, dynamic. <laughs> it's dynamic. I'm buying into that. This is, um, I was, I'm very lucky. My wife would say I'm not very lucky, or she's unlucky, but I, she says I'm lucky. I get to travel a lot, and um, I'll tell you about some of the stories and some of the organizations we've worked with. But I was working in Bahrain. Um, we were in with a, an oil company, and one of the first questions they said, they asked was, what the heck is knowledge? And if we can't define it quickly and effectively, we've lost it before we've even started. Their next question is, was basically, what impact will it have, not in the future, stop talking to us about strategy, but what impact is it going to have today for my line manager that's sitting outside the door? And if you can't answer these questions, then we get pink and fluffy and we're in trouble. And the, the problem that we get, there's nothing wrong, I can buy into certain aspects from that definition, seriously buy into it. The problem is that with organizations, and think for yourselves, if you gave that to a postgraduate, 
they'd probably turn around and go, okay, we can have conversations around evolving truth, yeah? You give that to somebody who's never touched university, yeah, that is coming in with basic skills and start talking about evolving truth, and they'll be like, what the heck? Where am I working? You know, that's the problem. But this is our big challenge. Is there anybody else who'd like to, who'd feel comfortable giving us a definition really quick? Yep. Yep. Applications of experiences, expertise, facts, and learning to situations. Applications of experiences, expertise, facts, and learning to situations. Okay. So what's the resource? If knowledge is a resource, what's the resource? And therein lies our problem. Okay. I'm going to do a couple of things for you. First of all, to move things along, because I want to get into the real meat of the, of the cafe, I'm going to give you my... Assistant, thank you very much. This is our definition of knowledge management, okay? I'm not gonna bore you with the details, but this isn't something sat around, that we've dreamt up thinking, sitting in an office, okay? This is actual serious research, and I'm not joking when I tell you this is over a year to give you this definition. We're academic sometimes, yeah? So this is what knowledge management is about. And if you can deconstruct it, all I'm really interested in you taking away is the idea that it's about the acquisition and storage, application, sharing, and development. Okay? That's what knowledge management is actually about. And when we talk about acquisition and storage, it does not necessarily mean technology. If only one person in an organization knows something, Storage can mean actually broadening that out and socializing that knowledge so more people know it. It doesn't have to be that we've just dumped it into a database. Okay? The next thing that I have for you is a definition of what we're managing. And this is what I would argue that we are managing. This is actually coming out in the knowledge management terms. This has actually come out from some American research conducted in the 90s by somebody called Holes, uh, two people, Holes, Apple, and Joshi. And these are the primary forms of knowledge. And these are the six things that every organization actually wants to know. And it's what you are setting out to coordinate. When we talk about knowledge, these, this is what we are talking about. Okay? This, I would argue, is easier for people to understand than some of the definitions that I can definitely come up with, yeah? And perhaps you've come up with yourselves today. I was also, Gary came to, to me and said, I'm on a bonus if I can stand still for 10 minutes in this spot. <laughs> I will try. Um, <laughs> can't be done. Um, but ultimately, to give you an idea of how difficult this is, okay, they brought together 100 academics. There's a clue on how, where this is going, just word academics. But they asked them to define knowledge as part of a knowledge management model. They came up with 150 definitions. <laughs> I'm not joking. This is published research, all right? Now, I know, I, the one thing I haven't told you, and I think, I think it's probably important at the moment, okay? When we start talking like this, people go, oh, great, university, academics, loving this guy. <laughs> Let's get him into a real organization. Um, as we said at the start, everything I do is about real-world problems. It's about solving a real-world problem. I'm not interested in theory for the sake of theory. I actually come from operations and project management. I've only been at the university for, for the last, uh, what, five, six years. And as somebody said to me this morning, I'm, they've never met somebody that works in a university that actually spends so little time in a university, and that cannot go on video. <laughs> I'm very lucky in the sense that actually because of my practical experience over the last five years I've been working with everybody from um, a Middle East government on policy development for knowledge capacity building in society which sounds great but it's basically how do we get people to be more competitive for that country right the way through to an American pharmaceutical company looking at uh, knowledge management, knowledge process diagnostics on their European and Asia Pacific operations, through to working with UK police forces, people like Scottish Water, Scottish Government, uh, right the way through to a 10-person non-government organization. And everything you're hearing today, they get and have applied. 
and we have proof that it works. And I think that that's important, because if you, I was sitting on the other side of this, I'd want to know where's the evidence. It's great that you're up here talking, Dave, but where are the, where's the evidence for this? How do we know it works? Okay? So if any of you are interested, there's lots of published case studies, reports, all sorts of things. It's all available on the blog. It's all free. Okay? So please take a look. But this now sets a context for us going forward. All right? We now know the problems from the environment, and we now kind of have an understanding of what we're going to set out to manage, and when we're looking to manage, what we'll actually be trying to do with it. Now we start to go inside the organization, and this is where it gets tricky. Okay? This is what knowledge looks like inside an organization. I'm going to try and explain it to you. And I said to Gary earlier that the one thing I hate, what, one thing I hate is with this setup is that I like to point at screens. So I'm going to be fair and come to both sides. If you can imagine, there are two aspects to knowledge. On the one hand, we have what we call technical or procedural knowledge. On this other side, we have managerial or organizational knowledge. When we talk about technical knowledge, we talk about things that are procedural, things that you can write down and capture. You're all familiar with the Apollo 13 incident, the CO2 canister? Yeah? They were able to, de to develop a 19-step process to be able to solve the problem. If you deviated from any one of those 19 steps, it would fail. If you read the process beforehand, you would know what the outcome would be. Okay? Cause and effect, very easy. Break one of those steps, you're in trouble. Another example that I like to use, think of a baker. Okay? Making the same loaf of bread every day, every week, every month, every year. All right? Set amount of ingredients, set technique, set process, loaf of bread at the end. If at the end that loaf of bread is burnt, then we know we can go all the way back, we can get to the point where it went in the oven, the oven was either too hot or it was in the oven for too long. We adjust that part of the process and we get the nice loaf of bread at the end. Procedural, technical knowledge can be written down and can be transferred relatively easily. Okay? How much value to the organization? Some would say that the moment that you can write all that down, the competitive advantage is lost. It can be transferred quickly, but, and it's great for maintaining a norm. If you look at Coca-Cola and their need to produce the same can of Coke, whether it's in Chicago, whether it's in London, or whether it's in Harare, they would, that's essential. No, zero deviation. Yeah? So being able to write it down, being able to transfer that process is important to them. Okay. The question is, how much of what you do can be written down, and where is the value in what you're doing? I was talking to the emerging leaders this morning, and I said to them, the problem is that we have this technical or procedural knowledge. You graduate, you've gone through, all gone through similar education programs, so what differentiates you? If organizations are interested in this risk assessment, business acumen, yeah, critical thinking, then what differentiates you? And if you can do me a favor, this is now the problem. Organizations are turning around and saying that this procedural, this foundational knowledge has value, but actually it's not the be all and end all. We're more interested in critical decision making. That ability to transform the, the, uh, the service, the internal or external service. The idea that actually this is about understanding the business environment. That's where the value lies. So, as we move away from this idea of what can be written down, how difficult does it become to capture it? Because knowledge is obviously important to us, so on the one aspect, we're asking people to write things down, we're asking to capture procedures, that's fantastic. How difficult is it to actually manage knowledge as we take one step away from that idea of things that can be captured in explicit form. And I'm going to give you a quick challenge to find out how it can be done. Are you all familiar with rock, paper, scissors? Yep. Yeah? I'd like you to team up in twos. 
So at your table, if you, if you need to go across another table, that's great. I would like you to play three rounds, listen, with, bear with me, three rounds of rock, paper, scissors. I would then like you, once you are done, to write down your decision-making process on why you decided to select each time rock, paper, or scissors. So over to you, you have five minutes, three rounds, rock, paper, scissors, and then I'd like you to write down your decision-making process. But the problem is that not only are you thinking about your decision, you're thinking about the decision of one other person. How difficult is that to capture? And could you write it down in such a way that it can be captured and moved from somebody on this table to somebody on the opposite side of the room where they could replicate the process? Welcome to the world of knowledge management. This is where the challenge really begins. Technology really only answers to one end of this spectrum. Technology can enable the transfer of information. It can connect people. But actually, when you look at it as a knowledge management solution, it's only responding to one aspect. And that's at that very ordered, technical, procedural end of the spectrum. The moment you've taken one small step, you're dealing with one other person in a decision-making process, and you have three, three options that you can select. That's it. And yet, it would be so difficult to capture that, it's incredible. This is where we start to look at human resource or social processes. We look at how do we actually share that? How do we share the understanding of that process? Actually, it's by doing what you're doing here, talking about it, experiencing it yourselves. Not something that you read about, but something that you experience. As adults, we are experiential learners. We, we, if you think about what, what you learn about your job, it's actually usually on the job training. I think it's, the statistic is something ridiculous. It's like 86% of learning is done on the job. Experiencing it, group problem solving, sharing knowledge through group interaction. That's where the secret actually lies. Beyond that, we've got another problem. And that is the fact that if we go back to the actual signals that we're getting from the environment, we're talking about the need for problem solvers, critical thinkers, communicators. And we are talking about competencies that are moving beyond this idea of foundational knowledge, going back to the previous slide, what people are actually looking for in the auditing field right now. Now then, when we start moving into this area, we start talking about being dynamic, agile, and adaptive. And what I absolutely detest at times is we love to throw around buzzwords, especially when you start talking to academics, consultants, yeah? where it's a case of the more ambiguity behind it, the better for me, yeah? I want to be very clear on what we're talking about. If we look at what has happened uh, over the last 15 years, because we have such a disruptive environment, if organizations cannot adapt to that environment, they die. If you want examples, Kmart, Blockbuster, Kodak. Did they adapt to their environment? Very competitive organizations at their prime. Did they adapt to their, their environment? And where are they now? If you want an even better one, I was in Helsinki talking to Nokia three weeks ago. And where are Nokia today compared with only 10 years ago? 10 years ago at the height of their power. Yeah, leaders in the mobile phone industry. Where are they today? I think it was four weeks ago, uh, less than that, three weeks ago, their credit rating was demoted to junk status. Will they ever recover? And the argument is they didn't adapt to their environment. If you want to look at it from your perspective, service provision is constantly changing. You are looking at client books, revenue generation, maybe it's internal services within an organization, how you position yourselves as business partners, how you actually provide value to the organization, are you seen as a strategic partner? And it's that 
ability to be able to adapt to the changing needs of the environment that is key. But it's built on individuals. And I'm going to try and clarify some things for you through some videos. The first thing I want to talk about is dynamic capability. Dynamic capability is about that individual skill level, if you like. Individual competencies, knowledge, knowing, expertise. You come out with it when you graduate, for example, you come out with a base level of knowledge. You start to apply it and you develop knowing. You know that it works, you know what doesn't work, you develop know-how, you know who it works with, when it works, where it works, why it works, all these things are great. If you, do, if you apply it enough times and you recognize the patterns, you actually develop expertise and you become somebody that is even more valuable to the organization. But it is built on individual competencies, your problem-solving capability as an example. So to give you an idea of what that looks like, I'm going to share with you a three-minute video. Okay? In the UK, I also wanted to bring a bit of rugby into it, if I'm totally honest, and this was the way to do it, okay? In the UK, when we grow up, we go into the playground and we play a very simple game. I don't know if you play it over here, but all the kids will line up, all right, against a wall. There'll be one kid in the middle who yells go, and you have to get across, and if you get tagged, you join the kid in the middle, and everybody else goes across to the opposite side, and you go back and forth. Yeah? And there will be one person standing at the end. Now, when we're talking about dynamic capability, that becomes very interesting because the person standing at the end has probably got a high level of technique and a high level of skill because they have been able to read the environment, adapt to the environment, apply that technique under pressure, and the person that's left at the end could be seen as somebody that has the most skill. If you look at an organization, that ability to read an environment, adapt to that environment, and provide solutions could be seen as being just as important. That's what we're talking about when we speak about dynamic capability. It's built on the individual. So I'm going to show you a video now that is based on the game I just talked about, except it's with rugby. For those of you who are, familiar with rug who are not familiar with rugby, don't worry. The rules don't matter. It, the only difference this time is that instead of getting tagged, you get tackled. Okay? What I'd like you to do is just keep it in mind when you're watching this that this is about individual capability. That ability to read an environment, adapt to the environment, apply your technique, yeah, and be the, what is in this case the last man standing. idea now that knowledge management, it's not purely about this idea of what we can write down, what we can transfer, but we're interested because of the needs of the environment in developing individuals. We've got the needs of the organization, but now we have to be concerned about the needs of the individual in order to create adaptive organizations for the future. If we do this well, if we bring in the right people into the organization, we develop them the right way, give them the right type of opportunities, all under a knowledge management program, we can start to talk about developing agile organizations. Agility, when we bring together enough dynamic people, we see a situation where we see an emerging problem. We bring dynamic people together, they leave their existing roles, they come together to solve a problem, and once that, or, that problem is solved, they can disperse again and go back to a different role. Okay? But it's that ability to be critical thinkers, to be uh, dynamic. There is no other word to describe it. Not stuck in one rigid role, but able to, cr to use their talents across multiple roles and understand the business environment and be critical thinkers. So the idea of agility, uh, are you familiar with flash mobs? Yeah? In the UK, there was an advert that was done uh, live at a Liverpool, Street, uh, a Li Liverpool Street train station in Liverpool. And what I'd like you to bear in mind throughout this are the, the idea of a problem emerging, people coming together to resolve the problem, and then dispersing. And that's the image I'd like to keep you to keep with you when you think of agility.
So now you've got the idea, hopefully, of the individual capability yeah, being transformed when those individuals come together as a group to resolve a problem. If that works out, we can now start talking about adaptive organizations. Organizations where people can come together, work as a team, recognize the changing environment, adapt to different cultures, yeah, different in, just the different environment that you can find as you move from one area of a state to another. The different environment that can emerge as, for example, in, in Indiana when we were talking uh, three weeks ago, the change where the construction industry has shrunk. And so it's mean that it means that people have ad had to adapt their service provision to account for that. So to show you what adaptive tries, what I think adaptive can look like, I'm going back to a rugby video. This is actually one from a commercial for a tournament that was come, that uh, was played. We play something called sevens rugby, which is just small groups, small teams coming together and playing a shorter version of the game. And this is all about. All I want you to keep in mind are the idea, the idea of individual individual capability coming together, functioning as a unit, and adapting to the changing organ, uh, the changing environment. Okay, so hopefully you've got an idea of what knowledge management can be about. What are the risks if we decide to ignore this? We've already talked about that it can be reputation, competitive advantage. I'm not going to read these off, but the one key one for me, if you look at the, the look at situation with people like Kodak, Kmart, Nokia, that last one of organizational resilience, that ability to adapt and to survive. Yeah, and the threat to existence and actual extinction of organizations, that's key. And if those organizations who thought they were too big to fail are failing, what does that mean to smaller organizations? Moving back on, if you buy into all this, or any of it, then you have to accept that actually what we're interested in is people management and development that we're actually interested in how do we get the right people into an organization in the first place? And once they're in, how do we create the environment where they share knowledge, allow us to embed it within the organization, allow us, for want of a better way to put it, exploit that dynamic capability for our own advantage? And that is key. And that means everything from the way that we do job design to recruitment processes through to interview, right the way through to induction processes. And I'm going to give you a quick snapshot. If we know that we are looking for people that can be dynamic and by that being critical thinkers and problem solvers, what are we doing within our organizations today to recruit those people in in the first place? If we know that that's what we need, if that's what we need to respond to the environment, what are we actually doing? The induction process, that for me is the, you're crossing the threshold into the organization. Your first day, you come into an induction process. What does it say about the culture of your organization? Most of the organizations I work with have had induction processes that are about going online or sitting down in the classroom and going through tick box exercises of listen to this, regurgitate it, or go online, read all this, tick that you've done it, sign it, electronic signature, and your manager says, yes, you've done it. How is that anything to do with problem solving? I was talking to an IT company in Helsinki who have turned around and said that one of their biggest challenges is that when they go through a tender process, they are not generating the bid quick enough. That their actual tender process, that sales bid, needs to be done in about 24 hours and it's taking two weeks. And they are turning around and saying, the problem that we have is we can't solve the problem. Well, perhaps you can't solve the problem because you are fixed, you are fixed on your current culture and your norm. What about if you take a different type of induction process where in your sales team you are seeing regularly 10, 15, they're growing, 10 to 15 people coming through in one go. Well, why don't you pose them the problem? What can you learn from them? Put them into a problem-solving environment the moment they come into the organization. 
give them the data they need, give them the environment they need, and set them the challenge to be able to design a process where this is done in 24 hours. Can you learn from them? Do they immediately get the understanding that their role is going to involve critical thinking and problem solving? Two very different types of induction program. Competency development. If critical thinking is a key element yeah, of the job, where does it appear in the appraisal process? How do you reward people that are good critical thinkers? What does critical thinking mean to your organization? These, all this, all comes under the guise of knowledge management. Now then, we also have talked about understanding the business environment. Part of what we do is an education program. This is what Indiana CPA, the society, the people that have been through the knowledge management course, this is what they spent two days understanding. What we've done is get them to, un and I'm not going to go through every aspect of this, but it's under using tools to be able to get signals and analyze those signals from the external environment. Using tools, you might recognize SWOT, yeah, looking at what's happening outside and how you bring it inside. We're then looking at different programs such as TAUS, which is about operational planning, through to Fishbone, which was scenario planning. We then want to understand all about the organization. We want to know who the key stakeholders, 360 degree analysis. We want to know what they need to know, how they need to know it, and how we should deliver it. We're looking at a cultural web. We want to understand what the culture of the organization looks like and what it means for process design. We start looking at something called organizational typology. Is it a very hierarchical structure? Is it a very flat structure? What does that mean for knowledge management? And all these things that we've been talking about today. We do things like a force field analysis, where we see who's kind of pushing against the process and who's bringing the process along for us. We do things like communication audit, the HR cycle, which you've seen. We start to look at a failure modes effect analysis. We look at what processes are missing. What's the impact of that? What's the potential failure that can be associated with that? We're talking about something that's very complicated. It's not as simple as bringing in a technology solution such as SharePoint and saying we now have, we are now doing knowledge management. And if you look, go back to the very start, go back to the beginning of the story, what's the pain point? And this is the response. It's not something as simple as being able to write it down and pass it around the room. Can you go on to the next one for me? Um, Chade Meng Tan is actually a Google Fellow. It's, it's the highest uh, rank, that, rank that is appointed, that is given at Google to, the, uh, to their engineers. And he's very famous. Uh, basically, when people go to visit Google now, it's not the chief exec they want to meet, it's this guy. Because he has been responsible for reshaping Google's culture. And there are, when you go into Google now, there are big screens with this gentleman meeting presidents, uh, heads of state, royalty, everybody. And it's about how do you actually develop this culture. And what he has said, is that it's all about the expertise. Yeah? It's developing that mentor habit. It's a developing that culture where you are willing to be a mentor and you're willing to be mentored. If you go back to what we discussed on the job training, it's about that experience, that experiential side. As adults, that's what we do. Yeah? And this is what is happening at one of the world's most successful companies and what people are trying to replicate. So that's my story. We've gone from the external environment, understanding what the pressure is, where the pain is, what the potential problems are, to then hopefully you've got an understanding of what knowledge management can be about, what knowledge looks like as a resource, going inside the organization. If you agree with these, the analysis, not just from me, but from people like Deloitte, KPMG, uh, Bain and Associates, if you look at all the reports that are being generated, they're all saying the same thing. The Economist Intelligence Unit, everybody is on song saying the same thing. So if they are right, then what are we doing to respond? And knowledge management is perfectly placed to respond. Just don't be afraid of it. And don't think it's all about technology. It's not. The key to it is this understanding of 
technical procedural knowledge and the value that that can bring to you. But the understanding, going back to rock, paper, scissors, the moment you take that one step away from it, how difficult does it become to capture that? And understanding that means taking a different view on processes. Going back to the HR cycle, how do you actually manage people? From there, it's about that idea of dynamic, agile, and adaptive. And that is the, fu that is the future for organizations. That is the challenge for future leaders. It's the challenge for leaders of today. How do you create that? How do you manage it? How do you develop it? And how do you maintain it? And how do you become more sustainable and resilient? That's the challenge. And that's what knowledge management can respond to. So now, that's me. The rest of today, or the rest of my session, is about you talking. And I can't believe I'm actually bang on time. The rest of this is about you talking. And are you familiar with the Knowledge Cafe concept? Yeah? There are two versions of this, and we're kind of doing a blended version. Uh, there's World Cafe and Knowledge Cafe. For those of you who are interested, there's a guy on the internet called David Gertine. Uh, he was recently voted one of the most influential knowledge management practitioners over the last 10 years for a very simple concept called the Knowledge Cafe. You'll see that there are three questions on your table. Yeah, you're going to be talking about each one for approximately 15 minutes. After you've uh, had the chance to talk on uh, the first question, we'll call time. And what we'd like you to do is a couple of people maybe stay at the table, and then some other people go and join other tables. Get other ideas. Don't answer all three questions at the same table. Get up and move around. What you'll also see is that at 4 o'clock, I'm going to do kind of a feedback session for you about what you talk about. You'll see that there's an A4 sheet. There's also post-it notes. As you're having your discussion, I don't want there to be one person that has to record everything. Okay? But as you get something that you think, hang on a second, yeah, that's relevant, I'd like you to write down on your post-it note either one, two, or three, and put a circle around it so I understand which question it's responding to, and put down your idea or put down whatever it is that's been triggered in you and put it onto the flip piece of flip chart for me, and I'll capture all that later and we'll come back and do the feedback session at four o'clock with you. Okay? But basically now, three 15-minute sessions, all right, I'll call the time. Nobody's going to interfere with you. We're not listening in and judging whether you're right, wrong, or anything like that. We want to know your own impressions. Okay? So over to you, and in 15 minutes' time, we'll do our first switch.